a lecture on uh, ethics of permaculture. And uh, before we get started with the lecture, I wanted to um, <clears throat> show you a couple of things you might think about when you're building, uh, when you have to build your project in the makerspace. You could think about having a, building a, um, a vertical wall garden, a living wall. Uh, and this is one with flowers and vegetables and uh, there's many of them online. I just thought I'd show you one and you could think about uh, building something maybe a little more modest for your project. Uh, here's another interesting thing. If you want to walk barefoot through the city, here's the place where no matter where you go, you've got a grassy lawn to walk on. So this is a quote from Bill Mollison. <clears throat> and again, this sums up a lot of the permaculture philosophy. <clears throat> again, permaculture is a system of design. It's not... Uh, it's not any particular one technique. It's not composting toilets. It's not solar energy. It's 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 the interconnection of all those things to make uh, human habitats that have the diversity uh, uh, and resilience of uh, natural ecosystems. So it's designed with nature. And <clears throat> so here's a quote from Bill Mollison: "The greatest change we need to make is from consumption to production, even on a small scale." So this is getting away from consumerism and getting more in towards um, you know, taking uh, responsibility for all those things in our life that we need. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the greatest change we need to make is from consumption to production, even on, if on a small scale in our own gardens. If only 10% of us do this, this, there is enough for everyone. Hence the futility of revolutionaries who have no gardens, who depend on the very system they attack, and who produce words and bullets, not food and shelter. So the other person who uh, developed a lot of the original ideas for permaculture was David Holmgren. And David Holmgren was a student of Bill Mollison when Bill Mollison was a professor. He was a kind of professor of ecology <coughs> and uh, wildlife management. And he, um, <coughs> David Holmgren was his student. And so uh, here's David Holmgren. David Holmgren is still active in, um, in teaching permaculture and writing about permaculture. Uh, he wrote a, a, a book a couple years ago. Um, <clears throat> that updated his current thinking. So uh, here's from, from David Holmgren. A more current definition of permaculture, which reflects the expansion of focus implicit in Permaculture 1, which was kind of the original book on permaculture. There's Permaculture 1, Permaculture 2, and then the Permaculture Designer's Manual. So <clears throat> the <clears throat> implicit in Permaculture 1 is consciously designed landscapes which mimic the patterns and relationships found in nature while yielding an abundance of food, fiber, and energy for provision of local needs. People, their buildings, and the ways they organize themselves are central to permaculture. Thus, the permaculture vision of permanent or sustainable agriculture has evolved to one of permanent or sustainable culture. For many people, myself included, <clears throat> the above conception of permaculture is so global in its scope that its usefulness is reduced. More precisely, I see permaculture as the use of systems thinking and design principles that provide the organizing framework for implementing the above vision. It draws together the diverse ideas, skills, and ways of living which need to be rediscovered and developed in order to empower us to provide for our needs while increasing the natural capital for future generations. In this more limited but important sense, permaculture is not the landscape or even the skills of organic gardening, sustainable farming, energy efficient building, or eco-village development as such, but it can be used to design, establish, manage, and improve these and all other efforts made by individuals, households, and communities toward a sustainable future. So again, it's a general system of design <coughs> guided by ethics, which is what we're going to talk about today, and principles that are ab abstracted from the observation of nature. So there's taking these principles that govern the, the development and evolution of um, mature ecosystems and applying those to uh, human habitats. So <clears throat> every system of design has an ethics. Uh, mostly they're implicit. They're not explicitly stated. And in permaculture, they're explicitly stated. And the three ethics are care of the earth, care of the people, and share the surplus. So we'll, let's talk a little bit more in detail about these. And th these, are, these are the particular graphic images that David Holmgren uses in his writing to refer to um, these principles. <clears throat> so first let's talk about ethics and design because permaculture is a system of design. And I saw this uh, drawing in the, um, <clears throat> in the um, Paris Metro and it says, I'm sorry but potable water is too expensive for you. And when we think about um, 
you know, that as a design problem. It's not a particularly expensive problem to solve. We could prob we could solve it for less than the cost of what wealthy nations spend on bottled water. Uh, and so it's really it's really an ethical consideration uh, that that we provide that everybody has a, a right to clean water. Here's um, <clears throat> part of, part of what I want to do in this course is introduce you to some of the leading thinkers in um, the sustainability movement. And this is William McDonough, and he's a designer. He's an architect. He was the head of the architecture department at the University of Virginia, and he has written written. A, um, book called Cradle to Cradle, where he advocates that um, <clears throat> we uh, redesign industrial processes so that the output of one system is the input into some to, to the next. And he, his famous statement is, uh, "Waste equals food." So we, he would he proposes two um, uh, cycles for the materials that flow through our through our economy and through our lives. One would be a cycle for biological nutrients that continually be cycled into um, into the the nutrient uh, and biological cycles of of, uh, of 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 methods of recycling, and then another one where technical nutrients, where they can't be integrated into the biological system, but they're integrated into industrial ecology, so that you continue to use these materials at a very high level. Because typically, recycling is downcycling. So you take something that is um, you know, very high quality materials, very, very, um, you know, took a lot of energy to produce it. And then you maybe use it two or three more times at lower and lower grades of use until you eventually throw it out in the landfill. So you might take a plastic bag and turn it into a speed bump and then it eventually ends up in the landfill. But with um, William McDonough, he call, he call, William McDonough calls that a cradle to grave approach. And what McDonough advocates is cradle to cradle <clears throat> so that we keep, you know, cycling those things at their highest and best use. So, um, <clears throat> but what I'm, what I'm going to show you today is a little clip of McDonough talking about design and ethics. In 1987, I was asked by members of the Jewish community in New York to design a memorial of the Holocaust at Auschwitz, a place for the Jews to pray. There was a convent that the Pope wouldn't help get removed, and they wanted an alternative proposal. I went to Birkenau in Auschwitz, and I stood in the center of Birkenau camp, which is a mile in diameter, three miles in circumference, and I realized that engineers and architects had come together to design a giant killing machine. If design is the, worst, the first signal of human intention, this was the signal of the worst of human intention. And I thought to myself, at what point does a designer standing there say, wait a minute, you're asking me to do this? They design a gate says the work will set you free. And the engineers design a railhead to bring people in on cattle cars, and they'd be taken out on one side where they would be exposed to, taken into gas chambers and exposed to Cyclone B being developed by E.G. Farb and Chemical Works nearby. And then they would have some of their skin would be stripped, their gold would be removed from their mouths, their hair might be taken for stuffing of mattresses, and then their corpses would be taken and, and into the crematoria where German engineers were calculating how to most effectively and efficiently stack the human corpse depending on body fat content so it would burn most efficiently. And if you came out on the other side of this car, you were taken to slave labor camp and you were used for slave labor by E.K. Farb and Chemical Works. And all of the cosmetics that you are wearing in this room were tested in human eyes at Auschwitz. At what point does a designer say, I can't do this kind of work? Not only can I not do this kind of work, I can't even participate in this kind of work. Not only that, I can't even condone it. In fact, I have to rail against it. Wait a minute, I actually have to revolt against this. I have to go to war. I have to become a revolutionary. I got back to New York. We were designing Paul Stewart's men's store. And I looked at our specification, and I realized that without being able to do very much about it, I was designing a gas chamber. We're sitting in one right now. These fabrics that you sit on contain antimony, a carcinogenic heavy metal. Don't squirm. <laughs> so, <clears throat> as you can see, any time we design something, there's, a, there's an intention, there's an ethic involved. And William McDonough is famous for saying, design is the first signal of human intention. And there's 
an example of kind of the worst of human intention. So how can we create the best of human intention in our designs? And that's what permaculture is about, and that's what the permaculture ethics are about. So the ethics are care of the earth, care of the people, share the surplus, or put the surplus in service to the fulfillment of the first two ethics. And share the surplus is sometimes stated as uh, fair shares. In other words, um, you know, um, live within your the ecological means of, uh, of um, what's fair for everybody on the earth. So let's talk about this. Care of the earth means provision for all life systems to continue and multiply. And in permaculture, the way we implement this, the idea is get your own house in order first. So take care of your own needs, get your own needs met ecologically. Start getting your uh, needs, your needs for food and materials for your um, building and all that um, right in your local community. <laughs> and then um, other places, remote places that we're, we're provisioning with you, the, the with those materials can be turned into wetlands, wildlands, and beautiful places. And then the other, um, the other um, thing here is leave the wildlands alone. So I don't know how many times I've heard somebody come up and say, oh, I've got this fantastic place that's right next to a national park, or you know, it's in this pristine, beautiful area, and I'm gonna turn it into a permaculture center. Well, in permaculture, the idea is we should go to those, those places are, are functioning, um, you know, ecologically they're 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 whole they're working and they're doing what they need to do for the greater good of all the life on earth <clears throat> and so probably the best thing is for us to leave them alone and then go to places that aren't working that have been degraded by human activity or other other means and 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 put the techniques of permaculture to work to restore regenerate renew revive those and, and, and make them functional ecosystems that provide services that we that, that all of nature needs, but also provide things for humans. Care of the people. So, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll, <clears throat> we'll talk about this in class tomorrow, <clears throat> but um, what does care of the people mean? M mean? What are human needs, and what does it mean both philosophically and practically? So we can think about the philosophical ideas around care of the people, but... <clears throat> <clears throat> what does that mean in, in our communities? And um, so here's my list. Uh, people have mate are <clears throat> material me beings, so they n need um, food, water, shelter. Uh, but they're also um, spiritual beings. They're, they're also uh, social beings, and so you need to love and be loved. You need a sense of purpose and meaning. Uh, people are, 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 are spiritual and ethical beings as well. <clears throat> and so um, material comforts, satisfying employment, Spiritual needs, the experience of being in some way. We, we do it through transcendental meditation. Um, we, um, there's many other different ways when you, which you can go in that direction of transcending. You see a beautiful sunset, hear beautiful music. Many different ways in which, um, in which we can have that experience of expansion on the way to the experience of being. Convivial human contact. You know, we're social beings. As I said earlier, we need to love and be loved. And then we have needs for education and kind of in, in improving our understanding of how the world works and our place in it. Um, <clears throat> Manfred Max Neef was a, uh, is an economist uh, from South America, and he looked at um, all the, um, he, he was an economist, I think an anthropologist as well. I'm not sure about the anthropologist part, but he w was looking cross-culturally at what um, were fundamental human needs. In other words, what do you see in each culture? There are certain things maybe that are, culture specific that are specific to a particular um, bioregion or climate. But what are those things that are, are actually fundamental human needs that are cross-cultural? And he came up with this list of, um, of basic human needs, which we might want to keep in mind when we think about care of the people in our design. So subsistence, uh, pro protection, participation, leisure, affection, understanding, creation, identity, and freedom. <clears throat> Well, let's take a quick look at uh, one of these, um, uh, Van Jones, who talks a lot about equity, justice, and sustainability. So let's take a quick look at this. Here we, go. we have problems in Oakland. Uh, school system, 30 kids in a classroom, six books, no chalk. Kids walk into school, most kids have something in their pocket. You're thinking to yourself, a knife. You're thinking to yourself, a gun. Think 
inhaler. Oakland was not designed for a green economy. In some ways, uh, for the past 40 years, it hasn't been designed for any economy. We have an asthma epidemic in Oakland because of the amount of pollution. We are just now at the beginning of this green wave of new technologies uh, that are environmentally friendly, and that green wave now has to be designed to lift all boats. What do affluent people, when they're concerned about the uh, negative economy, the gray economy, tend to focus on? Spotted owls, uh, which is important, uh, polar bears. In my neighborhood, you go around talking to people about polar bears, they're not feeling you. It's easy to, to say, oh, well, we want to have, you know, factories that don't pollute. Well, where are you going to put them? When poor people talk about, low-income people talk about, people of color talk about the gray economy, we tend to talk about asthma, cancer, Katrina. When you talk about eco-equity, you're talking about building a green economy that's strong enough to lift people out of poverty, where there are real green pathways to work, where there's real wealth building opportunities. Let some of these young African Americans be the people who figure out how to sell solar panels and let them become the entrepreneurs that actually create whole new markets. You know, we could have solar powered boom boxes and everything else. We can't just keep sending our children away to funeral homes and prisons. We've got to do something. We put forward what we call our Build Oakland Green uh, proposal. Anybody who wants to come and do, and do business in Oakland in a clean way, in a green way, they're going to go to the front of the line. What we're saying is the next big play in the economy is going to be greening the economy, turning away from the suicide economy to a sustainable economy. Let's make sure those communities that were locked out in the last century's pollution-based economy are going to be locked in in this new clean and green economy. So there's a little bit from Van Jones, <coughs> who um, <coughs> uh, is a pretty eloquent speaker on the, um, these issues of equity, justice, and sustainability. So another ethic, so we talked about um, care of the earth, care of the people, and now share the surplus. And the surplus uh, doesn't always have to be money. It can be time, energy, knowledge. Um, the idea is once our basic needs are met, we've designed our systems to the best of our ability. We can extend our influence and energies to help others to achieve that aim, sometimes stated as fair shares or living simply so that others may simply live. <clears throat> so here's a here's a little cartoon, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, speaks to this idea of live simply so that others may simply live. You know, so here's, here's people standing on their um, piles of uh, consumer goods. And, you know, the first guy, you know, his, his is smaller than the other one. It's not me who consumes too much. And the next one, looking down at the one who's little, uh, the ones that are have more, it's not me who consumes too much all the way up through here. So, um, <clears throat> uh, let's just keep going here. Life ethic, recognize intrinsic worth of every living thing. A tree, a tree is something of value in itself, even if it has no commercial value for us, that it is alive and functioning is what is important. It is doing its part in nature, recycling biomass, providing oxygen and carbon dioxide for the region, providing habitat, building soil, etc. And so here is um, <clears throat> um, the this idea that, uh, you know, it's easy to start thinking um, when you think about permaculture design is that everything is a resource. And, um, you know, that's looking at nature kind of an instrumental way that the reason that nature is kind of put on is, is around us for people just to use to get their needs met but um, really whether we find a use for something everything everything living thing has its own intrinsic value so I'm going to um, play a short audio of uh, Dave Mallet um, uh, talking about uh, reading an essay from Thoreau that Thoreau wrote about pine pine trees so let me just pull that up wrong thing Oops, it looks like iTunes is going to take just a second. Here it is. 
Strange that so few ever come to the woods to see how the pine lives and grows and spires, lifting its evergreen arms to the light, to see its perfect success. But most are content to behold it in the shape of many broad boards brought to market, and deem that its true success. But the pine is no more lumber than man is, and to be made into boards and houses is no more its true and highest use than the truest use of a man is to be cut down and made into manure. There is a higher law affecting our relation to pines as well as to men. A pine cut down, a dead pine, is no more a pine than a dead human carcass is a man. Can he who has discovered only some of the values of whalebone and whale oil be said to have discovered the true use of the whale? Can he who slays the elephant for its ivory be said to have seen the elephant? These are petty and accidental uses, just as if a stronger race were to kill us in order to make buttons and flagellates of our bones. For everything may serve a lower as well as a higher use. Every creature is better alive than dead, men and moose and pine trees, and he who understands it aright will rather preserve its life than destroy it. Is it the lumberman, then, who is the friend and lover of the pine, stands nearest to it and understands its nature best? Is it the tanner who has barked it, or he who has boxed it for turpentine, whom posterity will fable to have been changed into a pine at last? No, no, it is the poet. He it is who makes the truest use of the pine, who does not fondle it with an axe, nor tickle it with a saw, nor stroke it with a plane. Who knows whether its heart is false without cutting into it? Who has not bought the stumpage of the township on which it stands? All the pines shudder and heave a sigh when that man steps on the forest floor. No, it is the poet who loves them as his own shadow in the air and lets them stand. I have been into the lumber yard and the carpenter's shop and the tannery and the lamp black factory and the turpentine clearing, but when at length I saw the tops of the pines waving and reflecting the light at a distance, high over all the rest of the forest, I realized that the former were not the highest use of the pine. It is not their bones or hide or tallow that I love most. It is the living spirit of the tree, not its spirit of turpentine with which I sympathize and which heals my cuts. It is as immortal as I am and perchance will go to as high a heaven there to tower above me still. So that was, uh, that's Dave Mallett, one of my favorite singer-songwriters from Maine, who um, did an album where he, uh, he, he took a bunch of pieces from Thoreau, and... Um, and I think that really reflects this idea of, uh, you know, the difference between the instrumental use and kind of the her- inherent value of living things. When the chopper would praise a pine, he will come. cooperation <clears throat> this idea of um, you know this kind of tension between cooperation and competition uh, you know we've been you know we've um, oftentimes an idea is accepted by a society uh, uh, because it reflects kind of the underlying um, ethics and principles of that society and science is sometimes used in that service and so uh, with Darwin in his theory of um, of evolution and this kind of idea of survival of the fittest, you know, that was something that was very useful to this, you know, kind of developing um, uh, idea of, 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 of capitalism and market economies and competition. And uh, so, <clears throat> but the principle of cooperation is at least as important in, in, in nature as competition. And it's far more important in human societies. Um, so there was a, a, a great book called Mutual Aid, A Factor in Evolution by a guy named Kropotkin. And the mutual aid tendency in man is so remote in origin and is so deeply interwoven with all the past evolution of the human race that it has been maintained by mankind up to the present time, notwithstanding all the vicissitudes of history. So he's, what he suggests is this kind of 
co- idea of cooperation is sort of hardwired into people. And Lewis Thomas in uh, Tom, uh, Thomas in, in his Lives of a Cell, he said, life is cooperative rather than competitive, and life forms of very different qualities may interact beneficially with one another and their physical environment. Even the bacteria live by collaboration, accommodation, exchange, and barter. You're alive because there are billions of organisms inside you that don't have human DNA, and they collaborate with you, micro, the microbiome, uh, the microflora uh, in, in, um, in your gut, and, and, and microorganisms that are on your skin, and all kinds of beneficial relationships that we have, um, even, even within our own bodies. So, <clears throat> Bill Mollison, um, we ourselves are part of a guild of species that lie within and without our body. Aboriginal peoples and the Ayurvedic practitioners of ancient India have names for such guilds, or beings made up as we are of two or more species forming one organism. Most of nature is composed of groups of species working interdependently. Prime directive of permaculture, uh, and this is kind of the prime principle, the only ethical decision is to take responsibility for our own existence and that of our children. Make that choice now. Another... uh, uh, idea that goes along with this ethical, um, uh, uh, the, the permaculture ethics, is this idea of respect for otherness. You know, so what kind of world do we want? Um, do we want a world that, that, that is just completely centered on humans and, and, and their um, considerations? Or do we want a world that respects the wildness, of the, that inherent connection to source, that inherent interconnectedness of all of us? So we need to have a radical redesign for this regeneration and renewal, for this respect for the uh, uh, for otherness and things that aren't human. Uh, um, so permaculture, um, these are the this is the ethics. This is a uh, again a David Holmgren graphic, and the, here's the ethics in the center: care of the earth, care of the people, share the surplus. And then around the outside are the permaculture principles, which we're going to talk about in the next lecture. And the idea is, as you do a design. And you think about all these principles that are uh, really uh, developed from observation in nature. Um, uh, catch and store energy, obtain a yield, self-regulate, accept feedback, use and value renewable sources. They all uh, are, are looked at in the light of these principles, care of the earth, care of the people. They're put in service. to The, the design is put in service to these ethics. And here's, a, here's an example of, you know, you've got the permaculture ethics and design principles here in the center. And then as you're doing a design, it's kind of like taking those principles and ethics and taking a walk through all these dis- different, uh, uh, you know, disciplines, uh, you know, human disciplines like tools and technology, culture and education, health and spiritual well-being. So you're, you're putting together a design that, that, that integrates all these different things in, in the design. And then... You know, it, it, when you get out to the edges of this permaculture flower, you have all the different kind of strategies and techniques like um, using appropriate technology, um, ethical investing, conflict resolution, co-ops, forest gardening. Those are those are the things that kind of come out of this when you apply the principles and the uh, ethics of permaculture. So uh, here's two, two quotes we're going to close with, one from Bill Mollison, but in the end the question is not how do we use nature to serve our interests, it's how can we use humans to serve nature's interests. Now as a designer I find that question really in- interesting, and that's from William McDonough, the, the um, architect. And from Arishi, in higher states of consciousness, individual desire becomes spontaneously aligned with the need of nature, the need of the time. So this is, I think, um, you know, reflected in McDonough's quote here where he says, how can we use humans to serve nature's interest? And so what Marishi says in higher states of consciousness, um, individual, um, the individual becomes aligned with uh, nature's interest. And uh, thank you, and we'll, um, uh, this, this lecture is over.